Chris Christie, welcome to The Daily Show. Trevor, happy to be back. Um, before we start the interview, I want to know, what type of interview are we having? Are we having, like, a legit conversation, or are you gonna, are you gonna politician me? I only oh. ask you this because you're the one person who will tell me the truth about whether you will or won't. We'll go totally legit. Okay, like we'll we go did legit. did the last time, we'll go well, legit. Let's, let's do it, let's do yeah. it. Um, I love the, the title of your book, Chris Christie, Republican Rescue, Saving the Party from Truth Deniers, Conspiracy Theorists, and the Dangerous Policies of Joe Biden. It seems like the Republicans need to be rescued from a lot of things. Yeah, they do. And, and look, the biggest thing we need to be rescued from, or two, is the truth. You know, if we don't become the party of telling the truth again, we got no hope for anybody to trust us to do anything. And when we get all these conspiracy theories and truth deniers, it's just not gonna work. And so what I try to do on the book yeah. is to go through like QAnon mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Pizzagate and birtherism and the election stuff and say, here are the real facts. And I hope after you read them, you'll come to the conclusion, there's no truth to any of this stuff. And we need to focus on the important things that are going on in the country right now and being a good party opposite of Joe Biden and the Democrats, because the system only works if we have two parties. If we got one, not good for either side. Well, I think the system is broken because there's two parties, but that's another conversation well, that's a whole for other another thing. day. That's exactly right. right. Um, that's but, another book. But you know, you know, okay, this is what was interesting about the book, is that it felt like it was Chris Christie going back to his lawyer days. It felt like you were, you were prosecuting a case. You were laying things out. You were like, here are all the facts, and this is why this QAnon thing is BS. Here are all the facts, and this is why the election wasn't stolen. Here are all the facts. But surely you realize you are up against a monumental, like, issue here, because a lot of the Republican Party believes many of these things. Yeah, well, that's what leadership's all about, right? I mean, in the end, if you want to try to lead, which is what I'm trying to do, is to help lead the party in another direction, uh -huh. then it's, it involves some risk. Like, if it were easy, you wouldn't be at the front of the parade. You'd be in the middle of the parade. Right, so I'm taking a chance here, I guess, but to mm -hmm. me, it's a chance on the best thing to take a chance on, which is the truth. And you are not afraid of the, the Donald Trump element? I mean, because it, cause you're, not just, you're not just talking to Republican people here. You're talking to Republicans, but you know one of your audience members is Donald J. Trump. Sure. Who believes some of the things that are in this book. Sure. And look, I've known him for 20 years. Yeah. So unlike most people who know him of recent vintage, I've known him personally for 20 years. And no, like, I'm not afraid of telling him the truth. I've never been afraid of telling him the truth. Um, all the time that I did things with him, uh, ran against him, mm -hmm. and then helped to advise him, prepare him for debates, I was the guy he always brought in to give him a hard time. Uh -huh. And so the book follows in that pattern. Do you ever regret the fact that you basically took out Marco Rubio to help Donald Trump? I mean, I don't know if you did it to help Donald Trump. I didn't do but it to but you, like, took Rubio, you, like, grabbed... You, have you watched Squid Game? You basically did what <laughs> yeah, that woman did. Yeah. You grabbed Rubio and you jumped <laughs> off the thing. Yeah. He was doing well up until that point. Yeah, but, you know, again, it's the truth comes out, right? I mean, all I did that night was expose the fact... And I tried to do it for me, because, remember, that's before New Hampshire. Okay, got it. I was still in the race, and I knew that I had to beat Marco yeah. in order to stay in the, in the game. So, uh, but all I exposed was that he was being programmed by his advisors, mm -hmm. um, and we don't want somebody like that to be president either. So... You know, I did what I thought was best for me and for the party and for the country. It wound up helping Donald Trump, but that was not my aim. My aim was to help me because I was still in the race. So, no, I don't have any regrets about that. Go out there and be yourself. That's what I did that night. And you're right about the way I wrote the book. I did approach it like my days, my seven years as a prosecutor. Right. Let's get down to the basics, get down to the facts, and lay it out to people in a plain way. And I think, you know, I speak rather plainly. It's plain language, it's not lawyer language, and mm -hmm, hopefully people mm -hmm. who read it will understand it. But whether they do or they don't, it's important to say it. So let's talk about the relationship you have with Trump and then the relationship that the Republican Party has with Donald Trump. For many years, it was the party, right? Which is what many would argue good politics is. It's about the party and it's about the people who vote for the party. Now it has become about Trump. People say, I'm a Trumper. I vote for Donald Trump. The Republican Party comes second to that. You, of all people, understand how dangerous and unsustainable that can be, because that means one man can determine the vision and the mission that doesn't necessarily coincide with conservatism, whatever that may be in this day and age. So, when, when you, you... You have a relationship with Donald Trump, right? You guys talk... You haven't talked in a while now, mm -hmm. from what I understand, but, but, you sure. guys, but you guys talk. Do you see a world where, A, he doesn't, doesn't run for president, and then, B, a world where you can convince him to not make the next election about this? Because you know he's going to do that. Well, look, I think a few things. First off, there's a really interesting new poll today out of Iowa 
uh, Iowa Republicans being polled by the mm -hmm. Des Moines Register. And they're, they're amongst the most conservative Republicans in America. Um, they asked, where's your loyalty the most, to the Republican Party or to Donald Trump? Yeah. 62% said the Republican Party. Wow. 26% said Donald Trump in Iowa. So I think things are changing, Trevor. I think as he's no longer on Twitter, he's only been out of office for less than 10 months. Uh -huh. And he dominated all the political oxygen in this country for five years. Right. Right? So we are in an instant gratification society. People expect things you know, to happen like that. They don't sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so as the emotion drains out of this, and you leave the facts. I think people are going to say a Republican Party that's built on many foundations mm -hmm. is much more valuable than one that's built on one. And by the way, the president, the former president, can be part of that if he wants to start talking about tomorrow and stop talking about yesterday. No Republican should be talking about yesterday. We lost. We got our butts kicked. <laughs> we lost the House, the Senate, and the White House in two years. Mm -hmm. The only other time that's happened to the Republicans in our entire existence since Lincoln was Herbert Hoover. Wow. Not something you really want to go back to. Wow. We don't call that the good old days, Trevor. So that's what we should be thinking about is how do we get to the next step? And I think that that Iowa poll starts to tell us, it's not there yet, but starts to tell us that people are starting to let the emotion drain out and say, all right, so what are our options? Is this book your way of putting yourself forward as an option? Is this, is this you planting the seeds for you running in the next election? No, this is me planting the seeds for wanting somebody, because lots of people whisper this stuff to me. Uh -huh. Someone has to say it out loud. Someone's got to be willing to come forward and say, Here are the, here's the truth, uh -huh. and here's the path forward. It doesn't mean I won't run in 24. OK, OK. But you know, I certainly will think about it. Would you, would you run if Trump runs? Sure. Oh, so you'll run against Donald Trump? Sure. Where's the camera? Put this camera on Chris Christie's face. You'll run against Donald Trump? Yes. OK. Well, we're going to keep that tape. Keep that, baby. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you why. You it's don't feel a... pressure to not run against him? Because, I mean, we, no. we've, we've heard many Republicans say, I would run if Donald Trump doesn't run. I'd run. The only one I, who I know openly hasn't said this is Ron DeSantis. And it seems interesting there where he's going like, I'm not saying anything. And people believe that he could be a major contender. So you're not, you would run against Donald Trump. I would if I decide I want to run for president. And listen, I think anybody, Trevor, if you believe that you're the best person to be president of the United States, mm -hmm. why does it matter who else runs? OK. Right? It's, to me, it's almost disqualifying to say, I'll defer to somebody else. OK. Um, we're not talking about Dwight Eisenhower here. I like this. Um, you were originally, you know, I guess it was speculation. I don't know what it was, but people were like, you were supposed to be Trump's VP. Everyone said I, this I was is... down for the last two. It was exactly. me and Mike Pence. Right. And they said, this is going to be, it's going to be you as Trump's VP. And then it seemed like overnight, you weren't his VP. And then we heard you were going to be his chief of staff. And then almost, again, overnight, you weren't his chief well, of I staff. I turned that down. You turned down chief of yeah, staff. Yeah, as it's, I said in the book, I right. turned it down. Right. And so, so what's interesting to me is it, it feels like you were always in the orbit of being there to help Trump or to move things forward or to... I would love to know, as his VP or as his chief of staff even, what do you think you would have done differently to, like, what Mike Pence did? What do you think you would have done differently to his chief of staffs, plural? I probably would have gotten fired. Um, <laughs> because, because I'm like, the relationship I've always had with him has been, I tell him what I really think. And I know that at times that bruises his ego or mm -hmm. he doesn't like it. He's said to me many times over the years, you're much too hard on me. Um, and, and, but that's just who I am. And so the reason I decided not to take chief of staff yeah. was because after I talked to him about it and he offered it, I just thought to myself, this isn't going to work. Like, I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do to help him. He's not going to let me. So why am I going to go in there and set both of us up for failure? So that makes sense. Is, is, that, is that because you think that Trump is, needs people around him who are yes men? He doesn't want people who will challenge him? He wants to be his own chief of staff. He wants to call his own plays. Okay. And, and also, he wants to audible them. So it's not like he even sit down in the huddle and go, you say, I think we should uh, run a square out. And he says, no, 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 we're going to run the post pattern. No, he goes, square out? Okay. And then he runs the post pattern. Ah, and, and then I you see. can't, and then how are you supposed to operate under that circumstance? There's a great story in the book where after he had offered me chief of staff, when mm -hmm. I told him I had to go home and talk to my wife about it, and then I'd get back to him the next morning, on the Accela train on the way up, it's leaked that I'm going to be the next chief of staff in Axios. Now, the only people in the room when he offered it to me were me, Donald Trump, and Melania Trump. I was like, how did this get out? Like, I don't understand it. The next day when I called him to tell him I turned it down, I was turning it down, he said to me, 
how'd you like that story in Axios, though? <laughs> and I said, who leaked it, Mr. President? And he said, I did. And I said, well, what member of your staff did you have leak it? He goes, I don't remember. I called the reporter. Yeah, but you see, okay. But so is, who wants to be chief of staff yeah, but, under those circumstances, but is, Trevor? Okay, but now this is my thing. Okay, let me ask you another question. Yeah. Then. So let's say Trump runs again, and let's say he wins the nomination. Are you going to support him when he goes to be president? Look, if he doesn't stop talking about this election is being stolen, uh -huh. then I can't support anybody who winds up saying that our democracy didn't work. So apart from that, you would support him then? I, no, I'm not going to get into every issue. There's some things that okay. I would agree on, some things I wouldn't. But to me, this continued obsession, wrongly, in an untrue way, yeah. that the election was stolen, is just, is just something that I Well, it's I fundamentally be, eroding the country. Right? I can't be supportive. Look, when you get into this game, Trevor, elections are tough. Mm -hmm. There's always weird things that happen. Always. There's always odd things that go on in elections. I'm from New Jersey. We know this, right? right? But you play by the rules of the game. And if you lose, you lose. And you move on. And unless there's something you can prove in court that went wrong, and he mm -hmm. tried, and he couldn't 60-plus times, right? Right? then you've got to be a, a, a grown-up about it and say, the other guy won. Like, look, Al Gore in 2000 yes. fought it hard right. all the way to the United States Supreme Court. But when he lost, he looked in the camera and he said, George W. Bush is the president and I'm conceding. It's the peaceful transition of power and, that has defined America's democracy for that long. And that's what he didn't do, what Donald Trump didn't do. Yeah. And that's why I got so angry about it. You, you tell so many stories in the book that I, I, I've never heard before. They, they're really candid. I mean... One of the biggest things I never knew before reading the book was that when you contracted COVID, we remember this, you were on death's door. It was right? not good. I was in the ICU for seven days. Right. This was, this was it. Donald Trump called you, but he didn't call to check up on you. He called to check on something else. Well, I can't say he didn't call to check up on me. The first thing he did ask me was how I was feeling. Okay, okay. so he did okay. call to check up on you. He did. All right, cool. But then he said to me, how do you think you got it? Now, I've been in a room with him for four days before that. There were seven of us, and six of us had gotten it. So I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure I got it in the White House, Mr. President. And I, you know, I think so. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, sure. He goes, but you're not going to say you got it from me, are you? You're in the hospital when he's saying this to you. And so is he, by the way. He's calling me from Walter Reed Hospital. Oh, wow. And so this is a hospital to hospital call. Hospital moment. to hospital call. Okay. And, and, uh, and I said to him, well, I would never say that because I don't know that you gave it to me. It could have been anybody in that room. I, I, I don't know. But I, so I would never say this. So you're not going to tell the press that? And I said, well, of course not, because I don't know. And then he got off the phone. Man, he's a, he's a really interesting character. I mean, I feel like you <laughs> understand him more than most. But I, but I, I do. But I feel like Donald Trump has an ability to almost short-circuit America's media. It, it, he short-circuits the news. He short-circuits, like, polling. He, sh he short-circuits the, the status quo, is the best way to put it. Yeah. But you have always seemed to have a handle on him. Before I let you go, we, yeah. you know, we'll talk about, we've talked about Donald Trump. The last part of this book uh, is what I find interesting. Saving the Republican Party, also from the dangerous policies of Joe Biden. Now, yeah. you argue in the book that the, the, the problem with Joe Biden is that he ran as a unifier, and you say that he hasn't done that. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that he ran not only as a unifier, but as a moderate, right? Remember, he was the guy in the primaries that Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and... Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were all saying, was it liberal enough? Right. He was too moderate. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, his policies are way left. Well, but is it all of a sudden, though? If you remember, yeah. he did say at some point, if I win, we are going to put forward some of the most progressive policies this country's ever seen. He did say that. It, it, but, but he didn't campaign. The theme of his campaign was not that. He was going to bring the country back together. You can't unify the country by going way left or way right, because most of the country is not way left or way right. And here's the worst thing a politician can do, Trevor. If you campaign one way and you govern against brand, and that's why his poll numbers are so low now, because independents who took a chance on him yeah. and voted for him are saying, that's not what we voted for. We didn't vote for this. We voted for you to bring the country together and to moderate the country. And he hasn't done that. And I think it's the single biggest mistake he's made so far, uh, bigger than anything else he's done, because people don't know who he is anymore who were the independents who voted for him. Could there be an alternate uh, answer to that? Could it be that he's doing badly because of all the circumstances around it? So could it be that he's doing badly because people are saying, we voted for you and you haven't gotten anything done, as opposed to what you're trying to get done? Could it be that people are saying, we're frustrated with the pandemic, you said you would handle it, and it hasn't just been 
handled it. You know, it hasn't been handled. Gas prices are going up. Inflation is going up. Couldn't well, it also be well, those things? Well, some as people, opposed to some people not... would say that his policies have helped to create the gas price and the inflation increases and all the rest of that. And look, it but could that's also happening be... all over the world. So how could it be his policies? But well, no, because the America is still the most dominant economy in the world, and so when. But it's not an when, island. When look. When, when, you know, it's the old story, right? When the American economy, you know, gets the sniffles, the rest of the world gets a cold, yes, right? right? So we know that we're still the driver of it. But here's the thing. It could also be Afghanistan. Right. And yes, the awful true. way that he went out of there. Yeah, that is I'm true. not saying, this is my theory. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that uh, people can't have other theories as to why it's going on, Trevor. But what we can't deny is that a guy who was elected president with over 300 electoral votes yeah. just, you know, a year ago, is now in a situation where his approval ratings are in the low 40s, mm -hmm. upside down 12 or 15 points, depending mm -hmm. on the polls, and it doesn't seem to be getting better anytime soon. And the real question is, Joe Biden, that's 78 years old, does he have the political skills any longer to dig out of that hole? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're going to have to wait and see. I don't know. I'm skeptical about it. And I think he'd have been much better off if he'd been the Joe Biden that he'd been all the years he was in the Senate and tried to bring the country together that way rather than try to be FDR. Do you think there was a Senate to bring together, though? Because this is the thing. This is the issue I have, just as, a, as an observer of this yep. thing. Mitch McConnell, for instance, will always say, like, well, we've got to do this thing together. We've got to do it together. <laughs> and then what happens when the time comes? He he blocks people. He Like, Mitch is, is a genius when it comes to knowing how to, you know, figure things out. So was there a Senate to bring together? Here's why I think... Like, and I'll tell you why. I'll yeah. add on to this. Okay. Look at the Republicans now who voted for the infrastructure bill. Thir those 13 Republicans who stepped in and said, this is a bipartisan thing we agreed upon, and now Trump has come out against them. Multiple Republicans have come. They said they betrayed the party, but they're going, no, it was bipartisan, and that's how it got here. Well, and let me tell you the opposite side of that, why I think there is bipartisanship available in the Senate available. Because in the Senate, you didn't see that happen. 19 Republicans voted for that bill in the Senate, right. including Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell voted for that bill. And so I think there is a center that's available to be brought together. Um, and, and look, not on everything, but on this, there was. Right. And okay. what's going on in the House, I think, is much more a, a, a symptom of the gerrymandering that we have. Right? In the mm. Senate, there's two for everybody. In the House, you've got these gerrymandered districts where some of these people are in far right districts or far left districts. All they're ever worried about is a primary, Trevor. They're never worried about the general election. And so they go running in the other direction, both, both parties. We need to stop this gerrymandering in the country so that there's more competitive districts, so that people care more about getting things done mm -hmm. than they care about just pleasing, you know, any one particular constituency. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, thank you for the time. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on the book. I'm excited. I hope you run for two reasons. One, because uh, you make things interesting. And two, because you're one of the few people who on that stage is probably going to say something real to Donald Trump. So I well, really hope you do run. Uh, well, thank you. And listen, and you know, I'll provide plenty of fodder for you. Oh, my friend. On your program. My so man, you'll we're be on a beach. To help. You'll be on a beach one day, <laughs> and I'll be there to see it. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate Great to you. see you. Governor Chris Christie's book, Republican Rescue, is available right now.